and he was, he was paralytic, and God, Jesus heals him. Well, the one we're going to talk about today is one of my favorite characters, and it's probably one of yours, too. We're going to look next week at how the, his healing uh, just causes his personality to blossom. He's just one of the most exciting, fun people in the New Testament. It's kind of just does a little cameo, but he's a, a lot of fun. And we're going to talk about the miracle today and then look at the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church in light of the miracle today, and then we'll talk more about who he is next week, who this, this blind man is that gets healed. So let's ask the Lord to give us wisdom as we open up his word today. Father, we thank you. We just come to you right now with great anticipation because uh, you've preserved this word for us, and this word is true. Uh, there's so much lies and mendacity <laughs> in our in everything we read and see today. And so we are so blessed uh, to have what we know is the truth. And so we pray that you would make our hearts ready and prepared to receive this truth and be challenged by it. Uh, speak to us. Give us ears to hear and transform us because we took the time to worship you on this beautiful Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our scripture today is right out of John 9. You might remember he was arguing about uh, whose son he was, whether he was uh, an illegitimate son or whether he's the son of God. And uh, talking about who their father was, who the, the persecuting Jews were that were attacking him. Were they children of Abraham or children of the devil? And then next thing that happens is we see this amazing miracle. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Man, that's a rough time to be blind. I mean, that is really dark. So just imagine how difficult it would be to be blind today, <laughs> let alone back in the ancient world, uh, all the sad realization of your parents. You know, you look like a beautiful little baby, but then all of a sudden, they realize you're not tracking. Your eyes aren't moving. And they know that this means that at best, you will survive as a beggar if somebody takes the time and leads you to a good corner where you might get a few coins. And add to that the stigma of this is your punishment. This is your karma. What were you, a bad guy in the life before life? Or maybe your parents had sinned. And you could see maybe... Maybe there's some connection to gonorrhea here, that the kid would be born blind if his mom had sinned, or whatever it was. It's just there's something wrong with this guy, and, and we don't really want to deal with it like there by, by the grace of God. Goes, right, so we didn't, well, maybe there's something wrong with him. Maybe he had it coming. Maybe somebody, he's not as important as we are, and God's just not as concerned about that guy with all those problems. God help us. But Boy, the disciples didn't think twice about articulating that. And Christ's response is so uh, positive and, and the opposite of his, of theirs. They were looking back. What did somebody do wrong that this guy's in this terrible predicament? And Jesus just looks forward. What, what can we, what, how can God be glorified in this predicament? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should re be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me. Now, some of the translations say, instead of I, it says we. We must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That makes you wonder when he's not here. Who's the light of the world then? <laughs> yeah, we are. Remember on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the light of the world. Now he's saying, I'm the light of the world while I'm here. I'm the light of the world. i got to do these works as long as I'm here. But when he's gone, guess what? The Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, and we are the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which translated means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. 
This guy's been blind since birth. And now all of a sudden he's seeing. And it's interesting that the John tells us that the word Siloam means sent. And maybe that's because it, uh, it was a water source that Hezekiah had diverted into the city. Maybe that's how it got its first name sent. It was the water that was sent. But the apostles are called the sent ones. And, and maybe it's referring to Jesus or referring to uh, the we did, we're, to do, we're sent to do miracles too. I don't know. So he went and he washed and came back seeing. Interesting little factoid. I love these when I find them. Uh, the Jews of the first century seem to have had a tradition that saliva of a legitimate, legitimate firstborn son could have healing properties against several infirmities, including blindness. And, and that's still written in the Talmud, which is, would be written down about 200 years after Jesus, and, and these traditions preexisted. So here he had this big argument with the... Uh, with the Jews who were persecuting him about his uh, you know, legitimacy and his parentage. And so he does this miracle with his saliva, which they thought, well, according to their tradition, that healing uh, of saliva through the saliva was a validation of his legitimacy. Isn't that interesting? And he does what's unique about this healing is he mixes it with clay. Kind of like that's what his father did when he made man in the first point, right? He took the clay and, and formed Adam. And so he's saying, look, I'm, I'm so legitimately God's son that I take the clay and I heal like the creator out of clay. Now, I want to think about this in terms of the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church because I want to get our minds around how God looks at this tragedy that's going on for 2,000 years, but is really heightened in our day. And sometimes we see these persecuted people on the other side of the world, and they just seem so different than we are, and we think, well, maybe God cares about them out there. Maybe, it's, maybe there's a, a little bit of a, a seeing those folks like the blind man. Like, well, maybe they did something wrong, or, or isn't that just a bummer for them? But really, God's will for us is to fully connect with them and, and to pray for them when they're in prison as if we were in prison. And when they're mistreated, to pray for them as if we were mistreated. And when one suffers in the body of Christ, we all suffer. More men and women are being persecuted today for Jesus than any other time in history. Isn't that wild? And you see the kind of gruesome things they're doing, and it takes you back, and you go, because you see these things in history, you don't even want to think about them. But that was so far ago, was so long ago. But now we see these things today, and really, so I spent the whole week <laughs> listening to sermons and different talks about the persecuted church, and it's horrific. I mean, you, you, you see it on the news every once in a while, but it is unreal to think how people are living today, and to think the inhumanity of how people are tortured and killed and raped and enslaved today. Slavery is alive and well today, especially where the reign of Islam enthusiasts is. This is a local Christian, and he's praying in the ruins of a church that was destroyed in Syria. See, the walls are all blown out. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So as we think of this persecution, we think, you know what? Okay, this is in a fallen world. And, and God allows all the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin to just play out. And in our own lives, he allows the consequences of our sins to just play out. And it gets more and more horrific until we <laughs> repent and start heading in the right direction. But here we see God has given man choice and free will, and how does he use it but to do atrocities to one another, and even to those who are hated because of the name of Christ. And Jesus told us, look, the world hated me. You're not better than your teacher. It's going to hate you. So what does that mean? It seems to me that if we were to think about how God looked at the man, 
born to blindness, which is the result of the fall, disease, sickness, death, it's all a result of the consequences of rebelling against God and his ways. Well, he must see that today and go, the works of God should be revealed in these situations. Paul tells Timothy, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Hmm. Peter tells us, you shouldn't think it's anything strange or unusual when you go through persecution. Jesus told us that would happen. Very different than any prosperity gospel you've heard recently. No, if you love me, the world's going to hate you because you're not of the world just like I'm not of the world. Does God just think, well, we know something good's going to come out of it. Where's his heart, though, with regards to these people? Is he indifferent? He just goes, yeah, that's the suffering, but it'll be good for him in the end. He isn't. He weeps with each one of us. After seeing what people go through this week, I'm just thinking, oh, what are those things I was complaining about? <laughs> this is out of Revelation. When John, that's the same writer, uh, was saw this vision, he wrote, when he opened the fifth seal, Jesus was the only one who could open these seals, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were, was completed. heard the testimony of one woman living under persecution and looking at her children, praying with her husband, and said, how, how, what do we do with our children? And they decided they need to tell the truth to their children, that it's possible someday, we won't know when, men will come in with a sword and they'll ask us, they won't know anything about Jesus, but they'll ask us to deny Jesus. And just know that Whatever we do, we're going to be true to Jesus, and he is always in control. And if there's pain or violence, it'll only be for a little while, and then we'll be in his presence. That's persecution. And she thought, well, should we tell our children to renounce the faith that they might live? And she said, as she prayed about it, she said, you know, God did not withhold his son from me. How can I withhold my children from him and think that it would be anything but the best outcome? Well, here's a map. I put these maps up, and I bought, a, I bought four of these maps, and I really only need one. So if you're a person who really wants to pray for the persecuted church, I welcome you to take one of these maps that I have hanging up here. But it's interesting. So this map is really put together by open doors. These maps are by the same source, but they're produced by Voice of the Martyrs. Open Doors, Voice of the Martyrs, those are good groups if you want to follow and see what's going on in the persecuted church. But they rank the, the 50 countries where it is most difficult to be a Christian. You know who tops the list nearly every year? Lucadia. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what's in, you know what's interesting is they are tracking, they are tracking where there is... Uh, Christian, where not persecution, but just where religious liberties are being reduced, and America, the U.S. did meet that, because we can see the laws changing. So that's different than persecution, but when you see, it's like these are the, the canary in the, in the tunnel, right? When you start seeing religious rights diminished, and you hear people say, well, no, we believe in freedom of worship. When they do that, watch out. That's a little bit of double talk. Because, yeah, oh, you're free to go to your church and do whatever crazy thing you want. But when you get outside the church, you, your religious rights then stop. But that's freedom of religion. It requires us to, to practice our faith in the workplace, in the school, wherever we go. That's our, our conscience still dictates what we believe, what we do right from wrong. So, no, the top one is North Korea. That's the worst place to be a Christian. 
and it has been for the last decade. I was looking for a source that really summed up what we've been seeing for the last decade or so, and I found this source, and it, it was very concise, so I'll read it. It says, in Egypt, we see the bombing of churches during Palm Sunday celebrations, a day of hope transformed into a day of horror. In Iraq, we see monasteries demolished, priests and monks beheaded. The two-millennial-old Christian tradition in Mosul, Mosul clinging for survival. In Syria, we see ancient communities burned to the ground, believers tortured for confessing Christ, and women and children sold into slavery. The Christian population in Syria has been cut in half in just the past six years, plummeting from over 1.2 million to only 500,000 today. In Iraq, the followers of Christ have fallen by 80% in the past decade and a half. And across the wider Middle East, we can see a future in many areas without the Christian faith. I looked at all these websites for a good source. You won't believe where this one comes from. But tonight, I came to tell you, help is on the way. Now, who said this? It was Mike Pence. You know, we have been praying. You don't know this as well as you would in the second service because we pray through the, there's a prayer list on our bulletins today. You might check it out. We pray for different people in the church. Oh, <laughs> and we also have a benevolence fund that we do when we have communion uh, that if you give anything in that little box, it'll go to just that cause. But we've been praying for the persecuted church. And we've been praying that nations would move to help them. God, move a nation. For some reason, it just hasn't been a priority, it seems, for any nation, even ours. And we always pray for our president, whether we like him or not, whether he's your party or not party. Uh, we always pray for our president. The Bible commands us to pray for those in authority over us. But we've been praying that nations in power would move because nobody was looking out for the Christians. And so uh, this is really, this was Mike Pence at the Defense of Christians Solidarity Dinner just a little over a week ago, October 25th. It goes on. I'm going to quote from this quite a bit. But Jesus answered, and he said, it's not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is still day. Now, isn't it interesting that this man had this problem when he was blind, but the work of God could be seen when Christ interacted with him, when he reached out to him. And so if we're the light of the world, we say, oh, yeah, this is terrible, this persecution of the church. But boy, God's glory is revealed when people reach out to them, when we take time and pray for them, when we experience with them that suffering, when we you know, some people give their lives to just chronicling it. There's this wonderful woman, Nina Shea. She's a, an attorney, an international attorney, and all she does is chronicle the, the persecution of the church. She's been doing it for two decades, writing books about it. You can't believe it. The speech goes on and gives a little history. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the disciples of Jesus left their home country they left their land, radiating outward from Israel in every direction, bringing with them the good news that is still proclaimed to this day. But sadly, today, Christianity is under unprecedented assault in those ancient lands where it first grew, in the mountains of Syria, the valleys of Lebanon, on the plains of Nineveh, the plateaus of Armenia, on the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates, the delta of the Nile, the fathers and mothers of our faith planted seeds of belief. They, they, they have blossomed and borne fruit ever since. But now that garden of faith, generations in the making, is under threat. It's under threat of persecution and mistreatment. Many of the Christian communities that first embraced the message of Christ are today the targets of unspeakable acts of violence, 
and atrocity. And he says, let me assure you tonight, President Trump and I see these crimes for what they are, vile acts of persecution animated by hatred for Christians and the gospel of Christ. The practitioners of terror seek to stamp out all religions that are not their own, and believers of many backgrounds have suffered grievously at their hands. You see these, Druze, and even fellow Muslims. Yet these barbarians harbor a special hatred for the followers of Christ. And under the unwavering attacks, Christianity now faces an exodus in the Middle East unrivaled since the days of Moses. The truth is, radical Islamic terror is a hydra with many heads. But no matter what name they go by, or where they try to hide, our administration is fully resolved to destroy them, root and branch. And nowhere is our resolve more evident than in the fight against the embodiment of evil in our time, ISIS. And then he goes on to give an example of this woman, uh, Kalia, is a follower of Christ in her mid-50s. She was taken hostage in her homeland in Iraq. During her captivity, the terrorists of ISIS demanded that she convert. They held a gun to her head. They held a sword to her neck. But steeled by her faith, she refused. And with that faith, she fought back. She was beaten for her fearlessness, threatened with death on a daily basis. But as she told her captors, Jesus had died for her, so she was willing to die for him. Aaliyah's faith is an inspiration. It carried her through this terrible ordeal. She still lives, but tens of thousands of fellow believers and those from so many other faith traditions have lost their lives at the hands of ISIS. Be assured, this administration calls these vicious actions by ISIS what they truly are. They are genocide, and they are crimes against humanity. Just as important as driving ISIS out of existence is making sure that we provide aid and comfort to those who have suffered so much loss and grief and ensure that they can avail themselves of their right to return. What really made news is he said, the U.S. is no longer going to go through the U.N. to give aid to these people. Because the trouble was, the U.N. is very hostile to Israel, if you hadn't noticed, and also very hostile to Christians. So they get all this money from the U.S., and then channel it away from Christians. And so he says, look, we're just going to give it directly to the folks. We're going to use volunteers and, and organizations we can trust and make sure it gets in the hands we want it to go to and not unfairly separated from the Christians who are suffering. As countries and governments throughout the region begin to restore order, I promise you that the U.S. of America will strive to ensure that they respect the religious rights, the religious freedom of all their citizens. The right to worship according to the dictates of our conscience is at the very heart of who we are as Americans, as men and women created in the image and likeness of God. And protecting and promoting religious freedom is a foreign policy priority of the Trump administration. As we began to see the tides of terror recede, we can assure you that President Trump is committed to help the persecuted peoples reclaim their land, return to their homes, rebuild their lives, replant the roots, in the ancient place of their birth, a uh, uh, place of birth. We stand with those who suffer for their faith because that's what Americans have always done. Because of the common bond of our humanity demands a strong response. And so as a nation, we pledge to support them in these trying times. And every day, every day, I know the American people offer forth a chorus of prayers for these communities from our hearts to the heart of heaven. You believe prayer matters? Let's keep praying. And finally, I have faith because I am a believer. And I believe that he who said that when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. That he who said, I will never leave you or forsake you, never will. That he will stand with his people wherever they are in this, con in this country and in all the countries that are in our hearts this night, and he'll see the faithful through these troubled times. I truly believe that he himself will breathe new life into the community of Christ in that corner of the world where it all began, so help us God. 
Maybe you didn't see that on the news. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's a great speech. It's an even better speech if you hear the whole thing, and you can go online and hear the whole thing. And would that other nations would just see that as an example? Would that would the other nations would go, oh, why, where were we? You know, all those nations that said never again to genocide. I think that's what that kind of leadership might do. So today we take communion. I want to think about our communion with the persecuted church. Have you suffered persecution? In one sense, you have. Look what, what, what Paul tells the Corinthians. If one member suffers, all suffer together. So we may have suffered persecution but not even know it. Remember when Paul was persecuting the church? Jesus spoke to him miraculously and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He wasn't talking about the physical body of Jesus. He was talking about what he was doing to the church. He was doing to Jesus. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Hebrews 13 says, Continue to remember those in prayer as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So today as we take communion, I want us to think about, you know, this is a great privilege of communion. Is that it's our chance today to connect with all those folks we've been praying for. It's one, one bread, one drink, one Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, oftentimes when we, when we do our communion, we think, well, Lord, where am I? And, we, and that's probably, and that is a good thing to focus. Is my heart ready for communion today? But I would just encourage us today to think, where's the body of Christ today? It's interesting. We think, where's the body of Christ today strong? Probably these people we're trying to commune with today. You look at these persecuted churches where people are willing to say, you know what? We're not going to deny him. We, we look at their, at their buildings and they're all knocked over and blown apart. But the church there is strong. And, and really, the, the church that needs to be partnered with that is our church, the one in America that's so fragmented and weak and barely willing to take a stand. So let's, let's instead of maybe, you know, it's so easy to look down at the third world, let's look up and say to our stronger brothers and sisters, we want what you've got. We want that spine. We want to commune with you as we commune with the Lord, with the apostles and all the church over the, over the millennia. Father, we thank you for this chance to eat this bread and drink this cup in the fine company of martyrs who, who are even now draped with a special blessing of a robe provided for you because of their loss. Lord, they get a, a special reward because they didn't love life more than you. Lord, uh, sometimes we sing, let us live to make men free in the battle hymn of the Republic, but it was first written, let us die to make men free. And so, Lord, help us to, to love you with a love that says nothing in this world. This world's not our home. We want to be people with our hearts and mind in fellowship with you. And, Lord, we want to commune today with, with people of like mind. And we know right now your church is suffering and uh, families and children and women, Lord, it's horrible what's being done. And yet we can aspire to that greatness. Lord, we pray that we would make the most out of every opportunity because the days are evil. We pray that we would see the rights that we have that have not been taken from us and we would use them to full advantage to build your kingdom here. A, a greater prayer base a greater place of revival, Lord, how important it is, this powerful nation that we, uh, that we raise up leaders that are worthy of that power, that use it for justice and not, for, and not waste it, not, not make it a dangerous thing, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful legacy of Christians who have gone on before us, and, and we just pray that, that we will stand on their shoulders, fellowship with them this morning, Search our hearts, Lord. Protect us and purge us from cowardice this morning. Help us to 
hate the things, the sin that so easily ensnagles us, Lord, ensnares us. That we might be free here like they're free there, Lord. There, there, there they are in bondage, and yet they're free because nothing makes them cower. Nothing stops them from saying, Jesus. Lord, we pray that we could be that free. That we could be free from all the things that bind us, Lord. Addictions, pastimes, things that, that shouldn't have so much sway over us, and yet, yet they do, Lord. So we pray that you would search our hearts right now.